Hello, I'm Dr. Israel Barkin, the Medical Director of the Prostate Cancer Research and Education Foundation, and I'm very happy to bring to you a lecture that was given last September 2014 at the PCRI Annual Meeting, a lecture by Dr. Eugene Kwan from the Mayo Clinic. The topic is oligometastatic disease, that means the patients that have a few spots of cancer outside of their prostate. So let's go right now to the lecture by Dr. Eugene Kwan from the Mayo Clinic. So the title of my talk today is Prostate Cancer Oligometastases. I think that this encompasses the uh, metaphorical idiom of the glass half full or the glass half empty, depending on how patients look at it and certainly how physicians look at it. As always, I have to provide disclosure for my talks. Uh, I and Mayo Clinic have uh, received licensing payments for various intellectual properties that we have shared with industry. I would like to take this opportunity to point out that I've been very fortunate in being involved in a lot of ground, ground level innovation. I was involved in the development of the Pilimumab, which is frontline treatment for stage four melanoma and hopefully will be a frontline treatment for advanced prostate cancer. It was my laboratory that was involved in some of the groundbreaking work for anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-L1 therapies. Um, we don't get much credit, but we were the ones that made the observation that these molecules are tied to clinical outcomes. And it was my group that took the C11 choline PET scanner to the FDA, and we secured FDA approval and Medicare approval September 2012. Anyone that knows me knows that I try to be innovative and I really try to push the envelope. I'm very aggressive about these things. Prompted by that, this is a little pitch I gave to Mayo Clinic where I wanted to rebrand Mayo Clinic and come up with a uh, actual drive-through prostatectomy clinic. But this particular idea was shot down for various reasons and uh, I'm not really sure what the reason was. So today we're going to be talking about oligometastases and there's nothing harder to say for a Korean guy than oligo. I could actually say Oreo, but it's actually oligo. Oligo was derived from the Latin or Greek term which means scant or few, okay? So therefore oligometastases simply means a few metastases or a few spots of cancer outside of the prostate. This term was coined by Hellman and Winchelbaum in 1995, and they actually had three classifications for oligometastases for human malignancy, not necessarily prostate cancer. I find this classification to be a little bit too cumbersome, so I've crunched it down to two classifications. I'm going to talk about evolving oligometastases. These are metastases that dis, um, basically form after primary tumor treatment. And then I'm going to talk about residual oligometastases. These are little deposits of cancer that are left behind after systemic treatment of widespread prostate cancer. Now the rationale for treating oligomastatic disease is multifaceted. First of all, there are many effective old forms of therapy that you can combine to kill a little pocket of cancer somewhere in the body, no question, hormone therapy, surgery, radiation, etc. In addition to this, we have a plethora of new therapies such as chemotherapy, abiaterone, enzalutamide, radium-223, et cetera, et cetera, that can be applied to treat little deposits of cancer. We have phenomenal technologies nowadays such as pinpoint radiation, SBRT, gamma knife, et cetera, cryotherapy, proton beam therapy, all that stuff can be it's all cool and it can be used to wipe out little deposit, deposits of cancer. There's no question about it. And finally, we have phenomenal abilities now to visualize or hunt down or actually see little deposits of cancer inside the body. And this includes the C11 choline PET scanner, which I will use as a backbone for much of my talk. In addition to this, this is not science fiction. I mean, for a long time, there has been solid evidence that treatment of oligometastases can lead to curative, not palliative, but curative outcomes for some patients with human malignancy, including renal cell carcinoma, and my, uh, melanoma, etc. 
In addition to this, just at an intuitive level, it makes sense that if you have only a couple spots to treat, you are more likely to be successful, and that is the circumstance of oligomastic prostate cancer. Also, the smaller volumes are easier to wipe out. I mean, anyone in this room could tell you if it's small, it's easier to kill. If it's big, it's more difficult. And finally, at a biological level, what you have to know is that a small volume of cancer harbors less heterogeneity of tumor cells, and this means less potentially treatment refractory or resistant cancer. So from my perspective, one of the biggest mistakes in the history of treatment of cancer was the concept that cancer is a clonal disorder. This was a term that was coined and propagated for approximately three decades. And the notion was that tumor cells clone themselves. And therefore, as it grows, you get more clones. And therefore, as it spreads to metastases, you get more clones. And then, one day, lo and behold, someone would think of a silver bullet that could kill all these clones and the cancer would be cured. So this is what has been obsessively pursued by many individuals for many decades, and it is a falsehood. This is not the way cancer is. The reality is that tumors are, by definition, genetically unstable. They are mutation factories, and as they grow, they make variable cells that are different not the same as the original. And as those spread, you end up with metastases. And each metastasis has its own intrinsic characteristic with its own intrinsic cells, with their own intrinsic vulnerabilities or sensitivities to therapy. Therefore, as we all know, if you treat with a drug in this situation, oftentimes you will get a partial response, not a c complete durable response. So how this plays out in prostate cancer is as follows. In general, the average individual has their initial prostate tumor. They go to whatever doctor. They do prostatectomy, radiation therapy, cryoproton beam. Prostate's gone. Fifty percent of these patients subsequently develop oligometastatic or metastatic prostate cancer after their treatment. This is recurrence, okay? And every one of these sites produces PSA. So this seems to be very confusing to a lot of patients and also to some doctors. The PSA is coming back because each one of these spots have a little bit of prostate cancer, just like a dandelion throwing seeds and growing new dandelions. So PSA is produced by this. This is the phenomenon of biochemical recurrence. These are oligometastasis, and this is how disease spreads. After a while, the disease spreads even further, and you end up with widely metastatic prostate cancer. And then you go to the doctor, and he does something like hormone therapy. Then the hormone therapy is administered, but it doesn't cure the disease. It actually shrinks down the disease. And some of those metastases are left behind in the form of resistant cancer cells that can live on to another day. And they do, and they reestablish themselves as new tumors, and these new tumors then spread as wider metastatic disease. And along that journey, they also acquire more heterogeneity. They become more variable, okay? And then finally, you get sick again. You go back to see the doctor, and something like chemotherapy is done. But the chemotherapy doesn't kill the cancer because after chemotherapy, once again, you have resistant cells that are left behind and then they can live on to another day, they can reestablish themselves, they can grow, and then eventually they will spread, and with that spread they de will develop additional heterogeneity, which becomes highly refractory tr to treatment, and for many patients this, this becomes the end of the journey, right? Everyone now understands that. So in summary, my argument for going after oligomastatic disease is because, number one, it's simply easier to go after smaller volumes of disease. From a biological perspective, you're also dealing with less foci of disease, less cancer. And finally, you have less heterogeneity of cells that can live on and mutate down the road to create highly resistant cancer. So now I'm going to talk about distribution of oligomastatic prostate cancer. This is what I see all the time. And obviously the reason I'm going to talk about this is because later I'm going to talk about how we deal with it. 
So the idea behind oligomesthetic prostate cancer is you find early metastases and then you wipe them out. So they cannot propagate, spread, live on to create havoc in another part of the person's life. So these are average individuals that trickle through my clinic. We see about 40 a day now, okay? So these are individuals. This is an individual with a PSA of 0.94. He had his prostate taken out, and there's a little green spot where the prostate used to be. This is a local recurrence. This is not oligomastic prostate cancer, but this is recurrent cancer. And this is seen by our PET scan, and the highlights are always in the circle. Here's an individual that had his prostate irradiated and his PSA went up to 5.7 after irradiation. He went through the PET scanner and we could see his prostate was not killed by the radiation because the, radi because the cells are resistant to radiation. So this is another form of local recurrence. In contrast to local recurrence, these are individuals with oligomastic recurrence. So here's an individual with a PSA of 0.9. We ran them through our scanner and we found three lymph nodes down in the pelvis, common iliac and bilateral external iliac lymph nodes. This is oligomestic prostate cancer recurrence. Likewise, here's an individual with a PSA of 2.35 after surgery and he has lymph nodes filled with low prostate cancer in the back of his belly in the place where we call retro retroperitoneal space. So this is oligomastic prostate cancer. Here's an individual with a PSA of 10.2 and we see a lot of these and this blows our mind because we never thought the chest was an area where much prostate cancer is found. This individual actually has a lymph node next to his lung with a PSA of 10.2, and this is the only site of recurrence for prostate cancer in this individual. Likewise, here's an individual with a spot on his bone on the back of his pelvis, PSA 2.7. Bone is a common spot for oligomestac spread. Similarly, this is a gentleman with a PSA of 5.4, single spot in the middle of his breastbone, right in the sternum, PSA 5.4. And this is wild. I've seen 10 of these now in the last year. So the sternum seems to be a favorite spot for prostate cancer to go. This is a gentleman that has a PSA of 1.4, and the cancer is recurring in his neck bone, C5 cervical vertebrae. And this is an unfortunate gentleman that came to me with a PSA of 7.3. And lo and behold, the only spot we saw prostate cancer coming back on this individual was in the middle of his brain. So we got an MRI on this individual, and he, in fact, was growing prostate cancer in oligomastic form in the back of his cerebellum right here. Now, I put in these additional slides because I think that these are incredibly important to you as patients. Not all prostate cancer comes back and tells you it's coming back, and nowadays, with increasing regularity, I'm seeing patients that have PSA of zero. But we find cancer coming back when we run the patient through our C11 PET scanner. So here's an individual with a PSA of zero, and his sacrum is being chewed away by recurrent prostate cancer. Likewise, here's an individual with a PSA of zero, and he's got a chest full of oligomastic prostate cancer within the lymph nodes, and all of these are biopsy proven. Here's an individual with a PSA of zero, and every bone and organ in his body is replaced by prostate cancer. So this individual is in dire straits, all right? So do not live and die by PSA. PSA, especially with the advent of new medications, is not going to tell you what you need to know. You need imaging. You got to get imaging to know what's going on. So in the next part of my talk, I'm going to be talking about kind of the distribution of these things and how we treat them. And related to that, what we have found is that only 30% of prostate cancers recur at the surgical site. Okay? Only 30%. The reality is that 54% of patients will have disease elsewhere in their body, all right? 
and 16% of these patients will have recurrence at metastatic sites as well as the local site. So the pelvis, the site of surgery, is not necessarily a high volume area where prostate cancer returns, all right? So don't necessarily be so obsessed with, gee whiz, I gotta do something to my pelvis. In this part of the talk, I'll be talking about type one evolving metastases or oligometastases, and the objective here is that we knock these things out so that they don't spread to create systemic disease. For instance, here's a gentleman that came into my clinic PSA 4.5, and he had two very large lymph nodes above his bladder. This is way above the surgical site. So my colleague, Dr. Carnes, took this patient to the operating room because he did not want hormone therapy as a treatment. He said, please don't put me on hormone therapy. It's not gonna cure my situation. Take these things out. So we took these things out. PSA dropped to zero. Two years later, no additional treatment whatsoever. So this gentleman's been spared systemic therapy and he has an excellent outcome. Likewise, this is an individual that came to my clinic in, or in 2009 and he had a spot on his pubic bone down here um, which was associated with a PSA of 1.2. This was seen on bone scan which was obtained because at that time we didn't have a PET scanner. And this patient had his pelvis irradiated, so I decided maybe it would be worthwhile to irradiate this little spot with some pinpoint radiation. And many people argued against that. They said, don't do it, it'll never work, nothing happens, blah, blah, blah. Finally, we were able to find him someone to get him his irradiation. I think it was like uh, in Wacker Street Tunnel in Chicago or something like that. He got his irradiation, his PSA dropped to zero, he's had no further therapy, it's five years later. And he's got a normal testosterone, all right? So the people that say don't do that, um, I think that the responsibility should be to ask them why not, all right? So here's an individual that came to me with hormone-resistant prostate cancer. He's failing surgery, radiation, and hormone therapy. PSA is going up. Ran him through a scanner. He had one tiny spot on his L2 vertebral body. We irradiated that. PSA is now zero, almost two years out. And I swear to God this is true. This guy's a priest, all right? So here's a gentleman that has PSA of 2.7, and he's got a blazing hot lesion right in the middle of that breastbone, right there, PSA 2.7. He's also hormone resistant. This was pinpoint irradiated almost two years later, no additional therapy, undetectable PSA. Likewise, here's a gentleman with a lymph node which is hormone resistant, almost the size of an egg in the middle of his chest. So we had our thoracic surgeons pull that out with a scope and his PSA dropped to zero. One year, two months later, no additional therapy. So he's very happy. Now I put this slide in to keep myself honest. The reality is we do fail and sometimes we fail miserably and we probably fail a lot more than we want to. Here's a gentleman that came to me with a spot on his sacrum, PSA of nine. I treated it with radiation just like all the other guys. And he exploded into systemic disease, PSA 230 four months later, spots all over the body. So the reality is sometimes oligomastatic disease is not the end of the story, it's just the tip of the iceberg. And for that reason, for some patients we treat even more aggressively. For instance, here's an individual that has two spots on the spine, PSA of 2.1. I elected to give him radiation to those sites and chemotherapy, tax tier six cycles and hormone therapy for two years. The reason I did this is this is a 40 year old individual and I didn't think that hormone therapy was gonna cut it for him. Um, five years later now, he has a normal testosterone, PSA is undetectable, he has no evidence of disease. So I think for some of these patients, they require a little bit more aggressive therapy. So, likewise, this is an individual with hormone refractory prostate cancer up in the neck. 
He was treated with radiation, chemotherapy. One year later, he has no evidence of disease. And finally, here's a guy that walked in. He's about 40 years old, PSA of 31, and all of his disease is up here in the superior apex of his right lung. So we actually resected that. The resection alone dropped the PSA down to 0.43 a month later, and then the patient was treated with taxatier and hormone therapy, and he's doing phenomenally well with essentially no side effects. So this side effect discussion that people talk about, I think that that's overblown relative to potential benefits of therapy. So in the next part of my talk, now we're going to be talking about the hardcore stuff, the stuff that's really hard to treat. All of the other stuff was a little bit more straightforward. So this is type 2 or residual oligomastic disease. This is the stuff you whittle down, but there's still something going on. So the idea here is you whittle down the cancer and you wipe out whatever's left behind. If you don't learn anything else, I think you should learn this. If you have prostate cancer, with the way standard of care is right now, you will go through a journey of treatments. And the journey is basically called palliative or sequential palliative treatment. And with that, there will be peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, androgen deprivation, tax tier, response tax tier, Zytiga, nope, you know, failure of Zytiga, et cetera, Xtandi, radium-223. Everyone has peaks and valleys to their disease in this palliative treatment uh, uh, scheme. My basic opinion is that every one of those valleys that passes by is an opportunity missed for potentially curing a patient. And I think that we need to be more aggressive at the patient level, at the physician level, throughout the nation with trying to identify these spots and testing whether or not we can't knock this disease out. So, for instance, here's a 40-year-old uh, individual that came into my clinic with a PSA of 25,000, and he had baseball-sized tumors occupying an entire belly, he had liver failure, he had kidney failure, and he could not eat. So he initially was treated with hormone therapy, of course, and this shrunk the disease down, but I never thought it would go away. So I put him through the PET scanner, and sure enough, we could always see these lymph nodes shriveled but glowing. Eventually, they started to glow more, and his PSA went up, and he became hormone resistant. So we treated him with chemotherapy and with Zytiga because Zytiga became available. So instead of the spots going away, they became more numerous and the PSA was still there. So this means he is harboring resistant disease in these lesions. So finally, we decided to take him surgery and we stripped out all those lymph nodes. And three years later, this patient has an undetectable PSA and no evidence of disease. And I think that this is a pretty good situation for this individual. We just hope it will last a long period of time. Likewise, this is a gentleman that came to me with a chest full of cancer. PSA 88 after hormone therapy and chemotherapy. So he'd failed those two things. We treated him with one of our study immune therapies, and we were able to shrink his cancer down to 1.3 with an immunotherapeutic maneuver. However, the PSA was still there. It was not zero. And so I kept watching this guy, and eventually his PSA jumped back up to 1.8, indicating that there's resistant disease coming back. So we sent him through the PET scanner, and lo and behold, we found two lymph nodes glowing behind his pectoralis muscle. Now, I don't have pectoralis muscles. I don't work out or anything. But he has pectoralis muscles, and he had spots back there. So we took them out. We took the spots out. Three years later, no additional therapy, PSA undetectable, no evidence of recurrent disease. All right? So this guy's happy. This is a gentleman that uh, uh, was an IT guy. He was uh, 45 years old, PSA of 216 after failing hormone therapy and taxatier. Um, he was placed on BMS-043, which is the epipilimumab study that uh, we recently published. Uh, his PSA plummeted to zero, to zero within a couple months. 
Um, unfortunately, 16 months later, PSA jumped back up to five. So I ran through the PET scanner. This gentleman had oligomastatic prostate cancer recurrence behind the bladder. He was treated with radiation and Zytiga. His PSA went back to zero. Then his PSA crept up to 0 0.33, and he too had a cerebellar metastasis. So this was treated with radiation, but we could never get his PSA low enough. And finally, we found one last lymph node in the bottom of his pelvis. We went ahead and treated that with some spot welding, with some radiation. And now, four years later, patient has no evidence of disease, undetectable PSA. So we hope that he does very well for the long run. And I think he's doing well right now. So in conclusion, I'd like to just point out that I think that the frequency of oligomastatic disease is woefully underestimated. I think oligometastases are not, they are not synonymous with systemic metastatic prostate cancer. Clearly, systemic metastatic prostate cancer can be reduced or whittled down to treatable residual oligomastatic prostate cancer. Conversely, evolving oligomastatic prostate cancer can be treated to prevent systemic progression. Oligometastases can appear anytime, anywhere, during any treatment. So never abandon hope, all right? If you have prostate cancer, don't give it up. Keep looking for it. Finally, aggressive treatment of oligomastatic prostate cancer can clearly lead to excellent and durable outcomes for many patients. Now, these are my opinions. I'm sure that you thought all that other stuff was my opinion, but these are my opinions. My opinions are greater emphasis should be placed on identification and treatment of oligomastatic disease. I also think that our, our national effort should be more focused on potentially curative or more definitive maneuvers and not basically maintaining the palliative status quo. I think that is a mistake. In addition to this, I think that, you know, it's fine that we all brag about our new technologies, but it's pointless to have new technologies and drugs if you aren't going to aggressively combine them to get rid of a disease. We don't need more spaces or more technology to occupy this, uh, this long journey for these patients. We need to knock out disease so the patients can get on their way and enjoy their life. So I personally feel that we should start to abandon our, our rational obsession with one-step palliative approaches that have no prospects of cure and only prolong inevitable failure. So I'd like to thank all the people at Mayo who have helped um, uh, with um, you know, managing my patients. I want to thank FDA, I want to thank NCI, I want to thank CMS. And I definitely want to thank Prostate Cancer Research Institute, this group here. It's my favorite group to speak to. I think that uh, the people that put the meeting together are, they're kind of out there on the edge. You need people out, out on the edge. If you're in the center of things, you're never going to innovate anything useful. So I like this meeting and I, I really respect the people that put together the meeting. Finally, I would like to thank you, the audience. Many of you are my patients. And I'll just end with a quote from Winston Churchill, which I think is apropos for the idea of ending palliative treatment. Now is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end. But perhaps it's the end of the beginning. So thank you very much.